So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there was a running bet that I'd, there'd be less than five people. So thank you all for uh, making me lose the bet. Uh, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm, uh, as you can see, uh, Charu. My complete name is Charu Netran Panchalam Govindrajan. I blame my parents. Um, so yeah, first of all, before I go on to what I'm doing, disclaimers. Whatever uh, the opinions that I'm presenting now, they are of mine and not of Intel's. Um, and if I have not credited my sources and if it's uh, uh, incorrect, please let me know and I'm more than happy to change them. And uh, lastly, I was, uh, uh, didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I was listening to a conversation where people, AI experts are here. I am not an AI expert. And, and when I read the event description, I was like, uh, somebody took my uh, position too seriously. That's, that's not, that was not the aim. I'm not an AI expert, but I've seen a lot of customers who, you know, put these jargons out and nobody knows what they're talking about. So I'm just going to basically talk about these misconceptions. Uh, and, and I've worked with IoT customers mostly, and, and they also put these words out. So we're going to briefly talk about those. Um, yeah, before I dwell further into this, uh, just a small plug-in. Uh, uh, sorry about that, but uh, I come from a place called Chennai, and uh, the neighboring state, uh, Kerala, uh, has, uh, is uh, seeing massive floods, and uh, um, the people are struggling. And you know, if, if you just Google Kerala floods, you'll know, and, and they have an option to donate, or you can use any of these options. If you're interested, you can approach me or just Google Kerala floods. And if you are interested, please. So yeah, now we can dive in uh, about myself, Charu. Um, I am from Chennai. I uh, um, went to undergrad in India. I um, specialized in electrical engineering. Uh, I graduated in 2011, uh, 2010, and then I worked for around one year um, uh, in IIT Madras as a research associate. And after one year, uh, I, I came to Stanford for grad school. Uh, I again specialized in electrical engineering. Uh, uh, for some reason, it stuck with me. Um, and um, in between, during my grad school, I, I interned at Intel. Uh, I realized that there are some people from Intel and uh, uh, some ex-Intel folks here. Um, and I love the place. I went back. Um, I was one of the first few uh, people to uh, uh, be part of this uh, project called Open Interconnect Consortium, um, which was basically IoT standards and certifications. You know, this, this was a term that was being thrown out. Uh, everybody was part of this IoT hype, and we were not sure what was happening ourselves. So uh, just to make sure that there is a certification body making sure that there is you know, minimal amount of uh, reliability, uh, good communication protocols, minimal security uh, in, in all kinds of products, industrial, uh, smart home, uh, and different subdomains. So I was part of that, and uh, there were around six or seven of us in this, in this uh, uh, project. So different people had to diff you know, play different roles. Uh, and what that ended up you know, was that all of us were just doing going to customers or partners and saying, hey, join our certification. There are other certifications out there. They're probably not as good as us. We will build a robust one. And so um, what that gave me was different perspectives. I was able to go to partners and be like, hey, you are an OEM. You work with us. You probably will be interested in, in this specific pitch. So this is the way we kind of started working with customers. And it was a great eye-opening experience for me. Um, I started working with uh, ISVs also. and so. This is a great position where I was on a great vantage point. I could see the product in different angles, and I loved it. So the next position I took up was, obviously, product management. And I, I was in SSG. Uh, I'm still in SSG Software Services Group, uh, but I work a lot with IoT customers. Uh, I have been in IoTG, but then, you know, it's a big company. Reorgs happen. Uh, and right now, uh, as I said, when I'm talking to a lot of customers, they put this term, I want to smart something, or I want my product to have an AI feature. So yeah, I'm focusing on you know, trying to understand what the customers are saying and making the best out of the IoT infrastructure that Intel has, and, and also you know, using the AI PG group that we also have. So this is going to be the agenda of the uh, uh, night. Um, I'm going to talk about my PM experience. So it's going to be kind of broad, and we'll narrow it down to uh, you know, specifically the, as I said, my IoT and AI customers. Um, and so I'll talk about my PM experience, and then I'll briefly talk about what it means to be multidisciplinary 
in, in being a product manager. Uh, uh, you know, what, what that necessarily means is uh, not to be kind of master of everything, but kind of jack of all trades. Um, and then we'll also touch on what customers mean you know, when, they, when they ask for requirements. Sometimes they're vague. Uh, how is it to get vague requirements from customers and then go back to your engineers and sort it out? So we'll talk about that and how sometimes customers can be wrong from the industry. The market trends are going somewhere, but the customer is probably asking something, or vice versa, they're in line. Let's discuss about that also. Um, and finally, you know, uh, as I said, narrow it down, uh, specifically product management in the domains that I've been focusing on. And in, in, in the meanwhile, if you have any questions, uh, I was just telling him this can be as informal as possible, so please interject, ask questions, and we can also do you know, a final FAQ uh, uh, if you have any questions. Um, so you've probably seen these uh, Venn diagrams before. You know, wh why be a product manager? You know, because it's uh, uh, frankly awesome. You know, you, if, if you're a person who has good technical ability, you have a chance to now be creative. You also have a chance to now uh, uh, hone your business skills and so you, you kind of have this flexibility and, and uh, especially if you're, a, if, you're, if you're a person with AD, ADHD you know you, you're focusing on something and then your interest changes and you can go on something else and you can still be of some use so uh, yeah if, if, you're, if, if you have a technical background and if you, if you want to be a product manager it's, it's obviously possible if you've been in UX possible if you're, if you're I don't think a leadership person would want to be a product manager, but still, a product manager can get there. So uh, that's the reason why I want to be a PM. And, and as I said, more uh, experience with customers gave me a lot of vantage points, and that's the reason. So a typical day for me, uh, you know, it can range depending upon the phase of the product that I'm in. Uh, it can range from, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing customer visits or I'm looking at market research uh, or, or I'm, I'm working with the consulting uh, company who's doing market research, getting in information that I would require, uh, and documentation, oh good lord, documentation. Um, and then obviously uh, uh, working with engineering, you know, looking at the PRD, converting it to things that they want, you know, actionable tasks. Uh, and if you are, you know, uh, one of the many agile focused companies, you're probably uh, uh, doing all the scoping and uh, retrospective and sprints and everything. Uh, I was the other day uh, talking to a friend and he was saying uh, uh, an agile joke. Uh, it goes like, knock, knock, who's there? Carry, carry who? Carry over to the next print. And so this is, people, people have been abusing this, but anyway, uh, 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 this is also part of the job. And let's say if you're in the starting of the uh, product cycle, you're working with sales and marketing to understand the customer better. You know, they're the closest to the customer. So uh, if you already have customers, go and say, hey, are there other customers that I have uh, that, that I can potentially get for this product? Uh, or if you're towards the end of the product life cycle, you can again go to sales and marketing and uh, see how you can market your product and what is the you know, price point of your product. These are discussions you'll have. So yeah, depending upon which phase, I'm, I'm always doing the cycle. Uh, in reality, I am sleeping. So, so yeah, let's dive into what do I mean by multidisciplinary uh, product manager? Uh, I mean, product management is multidisciplinary. So, but multidisciplinary doesn't mean you're multitasking, right? You will be, you know, obviously doing things based on the face of the product. And so don't assume that when you're doing documentation, nobody's asking you to do customer visits and, and nobody's asking you to do market analysis when, when you know, you're, you're probably working on product support. So uh, it's, it's not a multitasking game. So if it's overwhelming, uh, it's probably because you don't know which phase of the product you're in and, and probably you should work with the customers and engineers in a little bit better way. And I think those are the main two stakeholders more than you know, your, your own leadership. Uh, I think if there is one place where you can be more assertive than any other places, it should be within your own management and not with the engineers and customers because they kind of, the, the, the engineers are doing the product for you, they're making the product and, and the customers are giving the requirements. So those are the places where you should listen, ask questions, those are the constructive meetings. So, uh, and yeah, nobody is expecting a product manager to build an entire product from ideation to end of launch and, and support from there on. Uh, uh, it's, it's not going to happen and I'm pretty sure as uh, I've, I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, with the conversations that I've had a lot of experienced product manager here I'm pretty sure you've all been 
part of some joke, uh, some uh, a joke that engineering is putting uh, on you or, or the design team. You know, I've, I've, I've uh, myself heard a few. Uh, 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 what is the difference between a product manager and a radio? Uh, at least you can turn off a radio. Uh, and and uh, uh, I've heard, what do you call the director of product management? Uh, entry level engineer. Uh, I've seen a lot of those, those jokes, but uh, they're going to hate end of the day your job is to basically make your product successful. And so uh, to make your product successful, you, you're kind of going to do whatever it takes. Uh, 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 your ego shouldn't come in the way. And so being multidisciplinary basically means you're the most empathetic person in your group. Uh, uh, engineers, designers, they all are going to do their job, but you would be the one looking at the product from the customer's shoes. Uh, you're probably walking a mile in every stakeholder's shoes, but an extra mile on the customer's shoes just to make sure that you're making the best product for them. And, and if you were the customer, would you be use, using that product? And that's the question that you'd be asking yourself all the time. So I've seen this a lot. Uh, I've seen other uh, product managers uh, also do this. Um, and and it, 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 it annoyed me when I was an engineer. So uh, I, I didn't want to do it. Maybe I'm still doing it. I don't know. I've not gotten the feedback yet. Um, but when you go to a, a meeting, if you act as the expert, they expect you to do more than just give them requirements. So uh, don't act as an expert uh, if you're not an expert. And nobody is trying to be an expert in everything. And you know, as I said, we're, we're going to focus on artificial intelligence. Even engineers are not experts themselves. They're learning these uh, for the first time. And in a company like Intel, it's a 50-year-old company, there are people who have been working there for 20, 25 years. They're learning these things themselves. They're skilled, they're extremely talented, but AI was not probably that big a deal 20, 25 years back. So they're learning things, so don't act, do, act as though you are an expert. But in, in my uh, a few years at Intel, I have basically been part of all these, you know, programming, roadmap, uh, strategy, uh, 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 you know, work with architecture, uh, uh, work with engineering for support, documentation, tech writing. Uh, you know, even uploading uh, pages on uh, intel.com. Uh, I've kind of done all of these things. It doesn't mean I'm an expert in any of those. Uh, I knew barely enough. Uh, I was badly competent to make sure that the product would be a success. And I had to also make sure I was always kind of trying to be aware. And this is something that uh, a good amount of Intel mentors taught me. Uh, uh, otherwise, I, I would just be freaking out. So uh, always be aware of what are the changes happening within your company, outside the company? Uh, uh, how is the market trend? Uh, is there changes in the market? Um, are there changes in the market? How is that going to affect uh, uh, your product? So you're always aware. You're always making you know, notes, and you're always uh, working with engineers. Uh, for instance, if there is a leadership change, just like how it happened in Intel, uh, is it going to affect my product? Um, uh, did, did the engineering team start using a, a new tool all of a sudden? Uh, is there going to be a change in process? How is this going to affect my product? So you're always on the lookout. Uh, so uh, you know, that means that you're kind of anxious all the time to make sure your product is a success. Um, and uh, you're, you're kind of constantly aware of how this would change the backlog. And, and should you go back and change the backlog and work with your product owner? Uh, if you're a product owner and a manager, your life is hell. But uh, are you going to work with your uh, uh, engineering team and engineering leaders, uh, the scrum masters, to make sure this is going to be, uh, you know, whatever uh, changes is going to reflect on the product backlog? This is something that you're going to keep doing, and, and that might mean a lot of anxiety. So another running joke that we have <laughs> is, um, if you've never seen this before, this is uh, an artwork called The Scream. Uh, the Scream is by Edward Munch, or Munch. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm killing his name. Uh, he would have killed my name if he was here. Um, and so there is a joke that a VP, um, a designer, an engineer, and a product manager go to a museum. And they see this artwork. And uh, the VP looks at this and says, uh, look at the vision. Uh, this guy drew this in the 1890s, and, and uh, it still is relevant. It looks great. Uh, if somebody has that much of a vision, uh, the artist, if he was alive, he would be a VP. And so the designer comes in and says, that's nonsense. Look at the colors here. Look at the uh, great taste and, and look at the creativity. Uh, that, is, that belongs to a designer. If he was alive, he would be a designer. 
an engineer comes in and says, uh, you guys are all wrong. This guy was handy, he had tools, he was able to use those tools, he's able to show precision, depth and all those things. He was definitely an engineer. The product manager comes in and says, uh, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Those two guys think that everything is normal, but the main guy seem, seems to think that something's wrong and he's freaking out. That's a product manager right there. So a product manager is going to freak out, always freak out. You, you know, sometimes you're always freaking out, the engineering team might come and say, hey, do you need ADHD or something? You know, do you have ADHD or something? Do you need Xanax or something else? I know a guy. Um, but yeah, that's a running joke that we also have in the, at work. So yeah, it, it's kind of trying to be the star of the product. You, you, you might have a technical background, in which case your, your uh, uh, star might be a little bit longer. But um, yeah, trying to have a well-balanced approach on, on all these uh, uh, five uh, scenarios. And, and, I, and I cannot stress the importance of sales and marketing. Uh, I think uh, after product managers, uh, sales and marketing teams are the ones which have been uh, you know, kind of ridiculed a lot. Uh, and, and I've seen that over a period of time, they're the ones who have helped me a lot. They have kind of helped me adjust the product roadmap. They have given me lots of insights about customers. So um, even though engineers might make fun of them, and not to take away any credit from engineers, uh, I think sales and marketing is also important. So all these five, if you can balance a good amount of uh, expertise in all these things, uh, you don't have to be an expert, but if you can balance it well, I think uh, you'd be a great star for the product. So this is where I come in with customer versus industry. Um, what do I mean by customer versus industry? You know, we've all heard this, customer is always right. Uh, and, and we've all kind of, I think you've all probably seen, customer is most of the time is wrong. And, and, and uh, when they ask you questions, you never know what they're talking about. You know, uh, uh, they, they might say things like, you, you go to a customer and he says, I want this to be smart. Like, oh, you want the product to be smart? I'm like, no, I want the product manager to be smart. Uh, you never know. So uh, understanding the customer uh, means that you need more experience with the customer and you need to clarify as much as possible. Uh, it's, it's better to get the awkward questions out of the way initially and, and make sure that your requirements are precise than actually building the product and then going back uh, and giving a prototype or a product which, which they did not want. And that's going to be an even worse meeting than, than a customer meeting. So work with the customer initially, try to make sure, ask multiple questions. As I said, um, there have been times where they've just used words like, I want AI in this. Like, what do you mean by you want AI in this? Like, can you give me more, uh, you know, if, if I'm building, let's say, a, a, a onesie for a baby uh, or a baby monitor, I want this to be smart. What do you mean by smart? Give me more. Do you want this to be you know, compatible with an iOS or an Android app? Is that what you mean by smart? Do you want this to have an AI engine which is talking to an edge computing device? And when I go that far, they're like, no, 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 I want this to just work with my phone. So if they say smart, don't write it down, and then go back to the engineers. And, and, and it works the other way around also. Sometimes when you go to engineering teams and, and, and then you say, this is what you do, um, they might just listen to you and start building something. And it might be way off from what you wanted. Uh, and, and you have to go back and be like, uh, did you build it? Uh, imagine the customer giving you something like, I want this uh, bulb to work on a Raspberry Pi. And then you, you see the engineering team later in the sprint in the cafe digging through a Raspberry Pi and you're like, what the hell are you doing, man? And it's like, you asked me to build this on a Raspberry Pi. So uh, work with the engineering team to understand what I mean by the Raspberry Pi. Work with them to at least understand this is what is required. This is the specific data that they've given. Uh, I, I want you to work on this. So that's what I mean by clarify as much as possible. Although I mentioned customer engineering, the, with the customers, ask them what they mean by their requirements. With the engineers, ask them what they've understood. Have you understood the requirements? If so, can you repeat it back to me? So it works both ways. Um, and sometimes, and, and, and I know, as I said, customer is not right, but we are not right either. So that's where. You know, treat everybody like allies. Work with them to at least understand what is the mission of the product. Uh, is there going to be any value add that you are giving to the customer? Uh, it can be B2B or B2C. Uh, uh, is there going to be value add finally? Are you just giving them whatever they asked? Uh, or are you actually making it better for them? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure a customer would be more happy if, if they've been found to be wrong and you're making it better for them. 
uh, obviously don't rub it in their face. Um, and empathize, as I said, you're one of the most empathetic people in your group, so uh, uh, empathize with the customer whenever they say something, as I said, smart. Read in between the lines. If you're not clear, ask them. And uh, this is where it gets interesting. So sometimes customers say something, you look at the market trends, they're not the same. So if they're aligned, uh, 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 take, for example, uh, uh, the customer wants a smartwatch. There are probably 100 smartwatches out there, and, and at least three relevant ones, the uh, Xiaomi, My Band, the Apple Watch, the Fitbit, they are three relevant ones. And apart from that, I can name a dozen more. Uh, there is Samsung ones, there is uh, 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 Nike had a fuel band which is not there anymore, Qualcomm had its own, Intel had bases, and so there are lots of smartwatches out there. So if the customer wants a smartwatch, uh, it's your uh, responsibility to say, what is my value add for you? And, and uh, uh, what is the competition doing? What is kind of my USP? Am I giving something for the customer in, uh, in the end? He's just asking me something that is already there in the market, and it's kind of a saturated market. Um, but if it's not that saturated, and if it's not aligned at all, uh, there is probably scope. If the customer is asking something which the industry has not seen at all, there is probably scope for uh, innovation. And there is also probably, you know, you can assess your own, uh, reassess your own USP and say, hey, I know all these things. Uh, my company is good at these. I can probably rehash this and make a great product. Uh, we'll be looking uh, uh, in the future slides about now, just because you have cool tech doesn't mean it's a cool product. So, uh, but again, it's it's an opportunity either way. And I'm pretty sure you've all seen uh, Jobs has said said you know the customer doesn't probably know what he wants until you show it to them. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've heard Henry Ford. The if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And uh, uh, this is Jeff Bezos, which. Uh, he said, uh, you know, customer might even say in, in his feedback, oh, it's, it's great, but uh, you have to keep, you know, focusing on delighting the customer and you will innovate only when you know how to delight a customer. So uh, I think there are lots of uh, products and companies, ergo companies, um, that, you know, are extremely motivated by competition. There are uh, lots of companies that are also motivated by revenue. Uh, but Amazon is one of those companies which is, extremely motivated by customers and, and they start having this uh, weird term called customer obsession uh, and so it kind of looks creepy but th that's that's what they try to say if are, they're obsessed with the, about the customer right from customer service uh, to day delivery I want to make sure that the customer is always happy and so um, I'm, I'm not sure about the customer obsession part but always be focusing on the customer because empathizing with the customer and we have seen a, a lot of products would you be using these products you know if, if I give you uh, a, a 4K resolution TV, 85 inches, and, and it's you know uh, good for families and, and good for uh, video gamers, and, and it has great sound quality and all those things, but if I find out that it's uh, even when it's switched off, it's snooping on me all the time, would I use it? And so would I ship this product in the first place? This, these are questions that we ourselves can ask. So you know, being on their shoe, being in their shoes is is going to uh, give us a great uh, vantage point, and and, and that is. I think, uh, very key. So as I said, uh, I think I spoke about this uh, a little bit. Um, just because it's cool tech doesn't mean you have to productize this. You know, the first one is, I think it's called the Twitter peak or peep. Uh, I don't even remember. It was that inconsequential. Uh, it came out in 2009. And uh, it's basically a smartphone. I don't know what's smart about it. It's a smartphone which has only one app, Twitter. And for some reason, they thought this would be a success. Uh, and not to make fun of any of these, uh, they probably learned lessons from these. And, and, and uh, by no means are these companies uh, 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 bad or, or struggling. There are two Google products that I've shown here. And by no means, Google is struggling. And so. Uh, it's not to ridicule these, it's, it's probably learning lessons from them and these product lines probably are still alive, they're probably creating newer versions which might be a success, but at least from the amount of money spent on uh, you know, product launches and marketing and everything, these were not deemed successes uh, by the companies themselves. And so uh, not to ridicule, it's just a lesson learning uh, uh, experience for us to look at these products and say, hey, what do I learn from this? It, could, it, it, should, it, should, it needn't be your product, you can still learn from 
uh, what are the failures, where did it fail, was it the timing, was it too ahead of its time, did they actually look at the customers, uh, for instance the, the Segway was sold for $5,000 when it first came out, nobody wanted a $5,000, you're probably seeing Segways even now but it was not a success by any means. Um, and so the Google wave came like a wave, left like a wave, uh, nobody knew it was supposed to be a social media messaging platform and Google has still been doing it. You see Allo, you see Hangouts, you see Android messages and there is something new. So yeah, and the second one I think you've all seen, the celebrities were wearing this, the Google Glass and, and uh, there was a famous term for people who wear this in public, it was called glass hole. Um, and, and Snapticles, uh, I think they came up with a new version called Snapticles 2.0. I think these are their way, way of iterating the uh, product, but uh, you know, early feedback is much better than late feedback, and these are actually product releases. They put in money for product launches and marketing and everything, so I think uh, uh, that's, that's probably not the best way, and even they would agree. So uh, just focusing on, you know, what are these, they were cool tech, nobody's taking it away from them, but should it have been productized? How many uh, uh, users did they give, uh, did they give it to? Uh, uh, it, was it uh, something wrong with the customer experience? Was it just not something people wanted? I have seen some customers want a smart fan and, and I wanted to know what the smart fan would do. Would it just detect the uh, you know, temperature and, and change it accordingly or, or would it work with the thermostat? Or, uh, and, and they just said, oh, you can reduce and increase the speed on your app. And did they even look at the users and did they want this in the first place? I don't think any user just wanted an app. Download an app and, and buy an $85 smart fan and, and then use their phone. So uh, work with the customer as much as possible and give them prototypes. Early feedback is much better. Once you release the product, uh, especially uh, for consumer products, uh, it's going to be a costly mistake. So. Yeah, so just because it's cool doesn't mean you need to productize. And so now uh, I'm entering the territory that I've been working on, uh, uh, product management for IoT. So what is this IoT? Um, it's kind of everything that's connected, and so that's why they call it Internet of Things. And then there are some uh, geniuses who came up with IOE, which is Internet of Everything. So they're just trying to make make it even more obscure. Um, but these are all the things that are kind of connected to the internet. If they are interoperable uh, and interconnected, uh, and if you can use the data, uh, uh, I think that is an IoT device. And so wearables are IoT devices, your smartphones are IoT devices, your smartwatches, which is part of the wearables, are IoT devices, edge computing devices are IoT devices, gateways. So you have a whole bunch of these things. And the subdomains of these, IoT is a huge, huge domain. And the subdomains are obviously autonomous cars, smart homes, industrial automation, uh, healthcare IoT, uh, smart farming, uh, and as I said, smart phones and other devices. So these are all still part of IoTs. And so when you're looking at customers, they can be working in any of these subdomains. And so, uh, and there can be a lot of overlaps. Uh, and so working with these people. And so when you're looking at this, I'm pretty sure you can start guessing. Excuse me. I can pretty sure you can start guessing uh, with, with this, there's going to be a lot of overlap with artificial intelligence and, and uh, what kind of use cases that would the customer want with these. So, um, so this was the expectation. There was a lot of hype around IoT. When I started working on this, I, I actually read these. There was Gartner Research, which is basically the hype machine for IoT. They said in 2014 that a typical family home would have 500 devices uh, by 2022. Uh, Ericsson said 50 billion by 2020, but the worst of all was IBM uh, in an investor briefing said by 2015 there would be a trillion connected devices, uh, a trillion. Uh, the, est the estimate right now is more or less 18 billion devices connected to each other. It's 2018, uh, 18 billion connected devices. So what was the mistake? Like everybody was hyping this up too much. Uh, I don't think they got the pulse of the customer. Uh, uh, and, and to be honest, I fell for it myself. I, I was, as you can see, I've been working with IoT customers for a while, so when I saw this, I was like hyped up. Uh, oh yeah, um, uh, all these, you know, uh, um, significant uh, research uh, organizations or, or uh, uh, companies have been uh, uh, predicting this, uh, including Intel, so this should probably be the next big thing, so let's start working on it. 
I don't think they understood the gravity of this. An IoT uh, uh, product has to deal with so many things from you know, the hardware part of it, uh, the networking part of it, the communication protocols that you use, uh, how secure is it, uh, is it uh, security in just the hardware level, the application level, uh, and, and communication level, uh, can it be, can the, packets, the, can the packets that are traveling between these devices be snooped? Uh, there are so many questions that were not answered. So, uh, w was the communication reliable? Uh, was, was a lot of the computing happening on the device? If this is a small device, where is the computing happening? Is it going to an edge device? And these things were not set up. Uh, and, and so, uh, edge computing and cloud computing were still growing, but they started predicting IoT to be far ahead of even those. So, I think that was the biggest mistake. And I, when I mentioned smart fans, uh, I think they did not look at the customer at all. They were just, they saw a cool tech and they were like, we are going to make this into a product. And so, uh, that's probably not the best way to go. Um, and and, and we, I, I don't know about other companies, but uh, I've worked in product, products where uh, we learned it the hard way. You know, we started working on some products and they were shelved mainly because we were just trying to make cool tech, you know, put all the features that we like into one product. Uh, and then you know, kind of show the customer how nice it is, and even the customers were falling for it initially, at least. You know, uh, you uh, uh, a recent survey also. I know you shouldn't be trusting surveys, especially after seeing this. But a recent survey said um, a lot of people who bought bought these uh, uh, smart lights from Philips Hue and all, uh, they were using it initially, and then. They stopped using the app, and they stopped using uh, uh, off late. There is a good amount of <laughs> off late. I'm pretty sure I, I was one among them. Uh, I was I was so uh, interested in it that I uh, uh, was trying to connect the thermostat and all these together uh, and using Raspberry Pi myself. Um, but yeah, uh, it was initially so nice, and and uh, uh, it meant that I was making my home smart. Uh, that was not the case. I mean, uh, less than 10% of the people uh, bought these. Less than 10% of the market that they, that the companies thought would buy this, bought these, and uh, even lesser percentage were using it. So they were using Philips Hue as just normal lights. You don't want to buy a $35 light and use it just like you can buy a $5 thing in a Home Depot. So that was, I think, the biggest problem. So right now, uh, I think we're still going at a, at a pace where you're looking at solutions and services or products which are just a small part of IoT uh, uh, and you will probably be stuck in anywhere between you know, the, the networking part or the cloud or edge computing part or, or uh, uh, just the device part. So, so yeah, it's an end-to-end -end solution and so you are probably somewhere in between here uh, but it's best to kind of understand where you are and keep looking at the vertical ecosystem and how you uh, are going to focus on your product being uh, compatible with everything else here. Uh, if you're building an application, is your application portable? Is it just going to be an iOS application? What kind of data is your application uh, getting? And if, if it's going to be data in the data management, uh, is this going to be a, 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 a data that can be reused by another machine? Because the entire point of IoT was just gathering data, uh, which can later be used for analytics uh, and hopefully AI uh, training data. So. Uh, was this done properly? Uh, uh, are you using XML or JSON? Will it be uh, compatible with another IoT device? Uh, are you, is, it, is it a device which has Bluetooth, uh, LE, low energy? And if there is a device that has only NFC, do you have a gateway which acts like a hub? These are questions that you have to ask uh, when you're looking at an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, if there are solutions out there, try to integrate your product and your solution with those as much as possible so that a customer doesn't buy your device and then feels kind of cheated that it doesn't work with anything else. And uh, as you can see, Google Homes and Alexas, they're all working with a lot of smart devices. And, and uh, it's getting better now. I'm going to say that it's not as bad as it used to be. Nobody has to keep downloading apps now. Uh, you can start giving instructions to uh, your uh, uh, home uh, speaker. But uh, yeah, that was, that was one of the things that, that I think led to the failure. And also, is, is your... Uh, solution modular enough? Can you plug and play things as and when things change? Uh, because as I said, these things change. Uh, tech, obviously, lots of things change quickly. And, and in IoT especially, uh, since I've worked on the standards and certification parts, uh, one day they say, hey, we're going to use the MQTT protocol. And next day they come and say, nope, we're going to scrap that. It's going to be co-op. And, and 
what happened to the products that were released in the last one month, which went, you know, as uh, IoT OIC was the name of our uh, uh, consortium. So what happened to the products which were OIC certified? They're out there right now, and they don't have MQTT. And now we have to figure out a way how we can do MQTT co-op uh, bridging. So these are issues that we have had. So always be on the lookout. When the certification bodies themselves are trying to figure things out, don't go too ahead of the game and, and pitch in all your bets there. Uh, I think one of the companies that have taken a hard hit uh, is, is a company that I admire a lot. Uh, they even have a, a great IoT platform called GE Predicts. Uh, but GE, as, as of now, is not doing great, mainly because I think they hedged their bets on some things which, which were not uh, probably uh, you know, for the best for the company. I'm sorry. GE Predicts? GE? Yeah, they have a platform. So uh, I think you, you've seen probably the AWS IoT, uh, and then there's Microsoft Azure IoT. These are platforms that are out there. Predicts is one of those platforms which GE, I think they acquired a company and they got this platform. I've worked on it personally. It's a great platform. You can you know, kind of uh, do plug and play with the devices that you already have. Start looking at how these devices are being, being used. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, they might have to discontinue this. Uh, it, it's still kind of working, but it's, it's not you know, matching the expectations of AWS IoT and, and Azure IoT and other. There was also a recent documentary which I saw where they were talking about, I forgot the specific term for it, but basically just using colors uh, uh, to say next level uh, uh, is shown in a green color and then you see keep you, you keep seeing green and so you you're thinking oh if i press green it's going to be next level and once your lives are lost uh, the button that comes up is one dollar ninety nine cents and it's in green in color so you, you're kind of programmed to think oh i should keep pressing green uh, and that's gonna and they're making money out of that so that's one one way of people using game, but these are all hacks, I believe. Uh, uh, mobile, uh, there are lots of analytical tools to see who are the people using this. I think when Snapchat first came out, uh, the, the biggest uh, surprise was uh, the app was specifically used during school hours, and uh, they came to find out that it's all teenagers using this uh, uh, for not just normal photos, but you know, uh, ulterior purposes. But um, yeah, that is one heuristic that they saw, and, and they had to start focusing on, oh, I don't want just teenagers to use this. How do I make this better? So, uh, yeah, mobile apps, um, the analytics depends on specifically who you're focusing on. Um, if you look at Apple Home uh, HealthKit, um, the app as such is not the unique selling proposition for them. The fact that they were able to integrate this app which are Apple Watch and, and uh, also uh, they, I think, <coughs> Apple, sorry, <coughs> Apple made uh, this uh, strategic uh, uh, partnership with Mayo Clinic. And so if you are a patient of Mayo Clinic, the data that you have with Mayo Clinic is now integrated with Apple HealthKit. And so all these things tied together, you're going to use the HealthKit app because it's more useful now. And so with mobile apps, it just... Uh, depends on which uh, subdomain that you're looking at. If it's a healthcare kind of an app, the app as such is not going to be useful. If it's a gaming app, there are so many addictive ways in which you can uh, keep the uh, users kind of hooked on. I think there was one book uh, called Hooked, which specifically talks about this. Where, uh, that book, it says that you kind of, for any activity, you try to give them incentive or reward. Yeah. And once the user experiences that reward, yeah. it's like some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that concept can be applied to people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mobile products, yes. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same with IoT products. Um, there is a, a good amount of dependence that they are bringing in here. If you get extremely dependent on the product psychologically, um, for IoT products, that never came up, right? Uh, it, it, you, as I said, the Philips Hue, I was playing around with it. And when I, when I even spoke with Philips later, much later when I saw some uh, colleagues, uh, ex-colleagues that I worked with who went to Philips, uh, they said that's not the best product. That they were. There are other products that they're working on. Uh, that's probably the most famous product that they have uh, out there in, in, the, you know, uh, uh, in home appliance products. Um, but yeah, it, it, it had the initial entertainment in a, a factor. But apart from that, it didn't fly. And, and the main reason was... Uh, they kind of equated mobile apps with IoT apps, 
the IoT apps is such not interesting. It's, it's their interaction with these interconnected devices that was uh, useful. And, and how useful is this connection, right? Am I, am I just going to use the app and see the lights? What comes out of it, right? And so this is where if, if you're focusing more on the AI part of it, as, as you go to the AI part of it, there is a dependence factor there. And I think uh, uh, there is a good amount of overlap in the use cases. And if you're able to focus on that, uh, you can get the best out of both worlds. Uh, and I think that is the bigger thing that almost everybody, uh, I'm pretty sure there are the Googles and the Facebooks are all looking at this already. Uh, and so, uh, but there is a key here. And, and, and I'll come to that uh, specifically when you're looking at AI products. So yeah, this is uh, one of the things that I've seen uh, a lot of my AI. And you know, they're also, as I said, focusing on IoT um, customers. They put all these words together, and, and they probably don't know what it is themselves. They, they just put these words, and it is for us to understand what this is. So um, they're all not the same. Uh, if somebody is saying smart, it probably doesn't mean uh, there needs to be an AI feature there, or you need to implement a neural network just to make sure this works. It could just be an interconnected device with, with existing technology. You don't have to build anything. You don't have to provide the engineer with you know, data sets or anything. So. Uh, uh, this goes back to you know working with the customer to at least understand what the customer is trying to say. So, uh, as I said, I went to Stanford and I had a prof and I I think he's not at Stanford anymore, uh, Andrew Young. Uh, he's right now. Uh, he was part of the Google Brain project and and uh, he's a, a great visionary in the AI industry. Uh, and I had a chance to listen to him in uh, the AI developer conference at Intel uh, this year. And uh, one of the things that he was mentioning caught my eye. Uh, if there is any, uh, for a typical human, if there is any activity that takes less than a second for them to do without thinking, uh, that can be automated uh, now or in the near future. So if, if you're able to see a stop sign and, and uh, you are able to interact immediately within less than a second, you're able to apply the brakes, that is obviously being automated. And so if you're able to look at people and you're able to say, hey, this is the guy who I saw last time. Uh, facial recognition. Facebook and Google has been doing this. This is automated. So uh, it's, it's not a, a, a specific rule. There are lots of, uh, 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 it's not a typical rule, but it's kind of a thumb of thumb, a rule of thumb to you know, at least go about. If you have some activities within your own organization where you think this doesn't require a lot of thought, it can be done within a second, you can basically automate it and make life easier. And so. AI has been existing, and so what is new in, in this? And, and this is one of the things that he touches upon. So uh, I'm going to talk more about what he was explaining to me, and, and, and this was just eye-opening for me, so I'm kind of the messenger here. Um, you know, If you're looking at this from the performance and data, initially with, with the traditional AI, when you're providing data, you know, the AI was learning and it was getting better and better, but after one point it saturated, right? It was not getting any better. So uh, it doesn't mean that providing a ton and tons of data to uh, your uh, uh, artificial intelligence engine or your neural network uh, is going to, I'm sorry, oh, I thought you were asking a question. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to uh, result in a great per uh, performance. Uh, once you build a small neural network uh, specific to your uh, data set, uh, your performance increases and then a medium level in your aim is to be in the uh, smiley face. So this is where I think uh, it's, it's a great uh, uh, virtuous cycle. Uh, when you're making a product, uh, you know, it's all about the data accumulation. I think that is key in, in, in products that are uh, IoT AI focused. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak only about uh, AI right now. And I'll tie it back to IoT and why the data that you get through IoT uh, devices is extremely important because it's part of the data accumulation strategy. So if you have a great uh, mechanism to accumulate data, you're going to make use that data to build a great product. You're going to give it to the users, and the users are going to you know, provide more data, and it's going to be a positive feedback loop. And this is something that uh, everybody's trying to do. Uh, anybody who's making AI products, they're, they're trying to do only this. and so. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure you, you guys have seen the capture thing. Um, you know, you've seen two captures. One capture is basically confirming that you're not a robot. 
the other captcha is basically trying to understand from your input uh, whether what it understands about uh, a scanned image is right or wrong. And so these are ways in which uh, your input is kind of helping uh, uh, the, the AI behind it. So, um, and also when I'm using the term AI, it's kind of a loose term. Uh, AI, a, a lot of popular culture has gone into thinking about Terminator and Ex Machina and all those things. I think we are, we are far from it. This is all supervised learning, and, and supervised learning basically means that if you provide a data set uh, and, and the AI algorithms can use that specific data set and go from input A to output B, and then using the output itself, keep learning. So that's basically supervised learning. Uh, as I said, voice, uh, it takes the voice, uh, and it obviously needs a lot of this data set. Um, right now when you're seeing uh, the Alexa and the Google Home and all, it's able to understand your accent. Um, it is able to understand whether you're uh, uh, far away or near. It took around 50,000 hours of audio inputs, which is you know, close to five years of audio input for uh, this product to get to that level. So uh, these inputs have been happening for so many years. And, and this five years of input data is what they are using to make it you know, a better product. So um, this virtuous cycle, I think, is, is the secret recipe you know, to make sure that your product is better. And obviously, you can start asking questions about, you know, well, how about unsupervised uh, learning and, and uh, uh, reinforced learning and all. We are not even there yet. The, the best reinforced learning that you can see is the Go uh, 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 game, that the Chinese Go uh, board game that uh, uh, made news. Uh, the Google AI was able to beat it. So those are reinforced learning. And so uh, supervised learning is where you know, you have a data set, and these data sets are labeled. Uh, I'm just going to gloss through these. Uh, as I said, not an expert. Uh, um, but these data sets are labeled. So if it sees a cat, it knows whether it's, it's a cat or not. So you're basically saying, uh, label these things as yes or wrong, uh, right or wrong. So uh, when it comes to unsupervised learning, the data sets are not labeled. It's for, it's like you are listening to a podcast in French, and you have no idea what is French. Uh, and and if you're listening to one podcast, you probably would have no idea what the podcast said. But if you keep listening to hundreds and hundreds of hours of that same podcast, you might start trying to get an understanding of how the language works. And, and you might start thinking, oh, there was a past. Maybe there is, there is a, a verb there or a noun there. And start making sense of if there is a little bit more, if you add a dictionary to it, it's going to get much better. So you're, there, is, there is a definition. There is a, there is a thin line between. Uh, Super, supervised and un, unsupervised learning. Reinforced learning also, you're not, you're not, uh, 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 you don't have any labels for the uh, data, but uh, um, on top of it, you're also weighing your uh, uh, decisions that are made. So for a chess game, you can backtrack the entire chess game. And if, let's say, a computer wins the chess game, uh, you can backtrack every move, and you can start giving it uh, every move a weightage. And, and as you keep playing this for multiple hours, if it, game, if it plays, let's say, thousands and thousands of chess games, uh, at one point, it's going to understand, oh, this is the best move for me to win. And so this, that's reinforced learning. But we're not there yet. Those things, uh, as you go from supervised learning to reinforced learning, the uh, money that you can make through these is much lesser, although there is a good amount of uh, uh, you know, a public interest in these. Uh, supervised learning is basically where we are at. So, so this is where, when you're talking to your engineers, you need to be a little bit more uh, you know, sophisticated. Uh, I'm one of the people who are, who's trying to learn how to speak with my AI engineers myself. Uh, if you're doing a usual software product, you, know, you can just go to an uh, engineer and, and, and show a wireframe model of, hey, this is, this is how I want my app to be. You know, I, I want my app to look like this. It should work like this. And, and the engineer can be like, oh, that makes sense. I'll, I'll work on that. Um, imagine you're, you're going to do uh, an AI product and, and you just start drawing a wireframe and, and say, you, you draw a car and say, hey, go do this. That doesn't mean it's an autonomous car. You, you have to give them data sets. So that's where I think it's necessary to speak the same language with the AI engineer. What they need is, is a, a good strategic data set uh, and, and also uh, uh, you know, uh, resources to build a good neural network on top of it so that they can build something for that specific product. And so you need to provide them you know, the data set and, and the, the algorithm that is required for it. So, one example of this, uh, and it might sound as though whole oh, AI algorithms are extremely complicated. Only the Googles and the Facebooks of the world can build this. 
uh, uh, depiction on the left is by uh, Wild Book, and Wild Book is this company. Um, uh, what they do is they scan for all these wildlife photos, and, and these are photos that they get from Flickr, YouTube, uh, amateur photography, uh, professional photography, uploaded on their own website. And um, they just look at all these uh, animals, and, and they also look at sharks and whales. And obviously there's facial recognition for humans, but for animals uh, you don't have facial recognition. So they look at the unique stripes for zebras or, or the uh, uh, lines on a, a whale's tail, and, and they look for these as patterns to understand what is that specific animal. They're trying to narrow it down to a specific animal, and they can even name the animal now. They can say that's really the whale, and then there is uh, George the zebra. They can start identifying a specific animal. So. Uh, one of the things that happened in 2015 was uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, this is a Chicago-based company. They, were, they, they had this tons and tons of data of zebras, and they were able to identify that there was a specific uh, conservatory in Kenya where uh, uh, the zebras, uh, a, a specific type of zebras, uh, uh, were actually endangered, and uh, they were not procreating, and there were not enough adults in the group to procreate. And so uh, they also realized that the predators in the, in the same vicinity are doing much better than the uh, zebra. So they were able to alert the park uh, authorities saying, hey, your zebras are endangered. The lions out there are doing much better. They're going to kill all the zebras, and that zebra is going to be extinct. Uh, and so the park uh, authorities were able to come in. They were like, hey, we're going to do birth control for the lions, and we're going to make sure that these zebras are preserved. So uh, this is specific. No Google or Facebook could have done this because they did not have the data set. They were not uh, I don't think Google was going behind zebra pictures. And so uh, that was specific to them. So building a strategic data accumulation, uh, 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 accumulation was, was a key indefensible strategy for their product to grow, and, and they were able to make use of it. And another thing, it kind of looks vague, but uh, a lot of uh, hospitals these days are penalized for uh, something called a risk of return uh, or, or, or readmission. So. Uh, uh, patients who have uh, cardiovascular problems or pneumonia, if they get readmitted in 30 days, uh, they're penalized because uh, hospitals are not treating them well, and if they keep coming back, hospitals are trying to make money out of them. That is kind of the understanding out of this. So how do we make this better for hospitals? Are hospitals actually trying to make money? Not necessarily, but sometimes doctors are not able to diagnose this as well. And so can we use existing data? Can the hospitals curate the data and make it in one unified data warehouse where they can start calculating the risk of return so that they don't have to pay the price, they don't have to pay the penalty, or they don't have to uh, 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 look at, oh, are we actually providing quality health care? So these are ways in which they can question. So you can start looking at, oh, what is the age of the patient? How, what is the family history? What ethnicity is he? Uh, what is the weight? What are the food habits? Uh, uh, if they look at me, they know that I have fries for breakfast, so they'll know I'm coming back. But these are ways in which they can look at risk of return. And the lesser the risk, the better for them to you know, let them go and discharge them. So uh, this is another use case where the hospital can curate this data much better. It's a heavily regulated industry, and they are the ones who can get this data more than you know, uh, any other company. And as we know, Amazon is getting into healthcare right now. And one of the best uh, investments for them would have been something like Apple Watch, where they already have a good amount of uh, uh, patient data. So uh, uh, that's another way where you know AI is helping uh, companies, uh, and they don't need the support of all the tech biggies. And this means that the barrier is low, and, and a lot of companies can come in, and it's still an exciting opportunity out there. And so this, these are the ways in which your PRD would change. You're not, you're not basically just building a usual, get the requirements, get the epics, start breaking it down to uh, tasks, user stories, tasks, and then work with engineers. You have to provide them data sets, or at least means to get good data sets. And you, it has to be unified. If, if you're able to provide information, but it's all you know, not in one place for the engineer or the algorithm to calculate, then it's a waste of accumulation of data. Like, uh, uh, for instance, let's say uh, th 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 this is one of the things that people you know, come up with as, as use case scenarios. Uh, it's a hot summer's day, uh, you're wearing a smartwatch, and these days smartwatch come with you know, sweat sensor, you know, it looks at your perspiration and everything. Uh, and uh, let's say you go for a jog, it's a hot summer day, weather data is public. So you're going for a run, the uh, smart 
tracker can understand that you're going for a run and it's able to look at your heart rate it's able to see that you're pres uh, you're sweating and so by the end of your run let's say you're looking up facebook or yelp or, or google and if it's able to, if it's able to suggest hey there is uh, jamba juice nearby and there is 20% off or there is uh, whole foods nearby and pressed juice is 15% off you would be interested in it and that's a great ad revenue for them and so how did you get this data? Was it unified for the algorithm to use uh, in, in that specific scenario? And this is real-time data that they could have used. And so uh, this is something that companies like Intel are doing. Uh, Intel has lots of businesses. Uh, and so uh, if you're focusing on getting AI into your uh, company, getting AI talent into these things, as I said, I'm learning myself from AI engineers. It's difficult to get them to join your groups specifically. You know, if I'm going to say, hey, I'm, I'm working on IoT products, he's going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in AI. Uh, but there is an overlap, and it's difficult to show them what that is. So a lot of companies, including Google and Intel, they have a specific AIPG group, uh, AI platform group, that works closely with other groups, and we are trying to automate as much as possible in you know, internal tools, uh, even other external customers. And it's, it's better to do this matrix the, the AI engineers into your other uh, business units than just you know, try to hire. If, if your company has a gift card business and if you're trying to hire an AI engineer, no AI engineer would say, I'm going to work for a gift card business unit in your company. Uh, so it's better to have the specific business unit of AI and then say, hey, you work next to the gift card people and, and help them with this. So that's one way of Intel doing it. And I'm seeing a lot of companies do this. And so finally, I'm going to leave you with this. This is where I think IoT and AI play a great role, uh, especially in a use case like smart cities. IoT devices are always curating data. So not creating some, you know, these smart, fancy devices, but actually using sensors and actuators uh, to measure what's happening when it comes to energy uh, consumption, uh, garbage disposal. These are things that are traffic uh, uh, um, uh, sensors. These are things where you know, you can look at the data real time and use good. All this data is basically uh, data that you can use for your own AI engines to read and say, hey, this is my prediction. Uh, uh, the, I, I live in Sunnyvale, so the other day uh, uh, there was some kind of an event in Sunnyvale downtown. If you have never been to Sunnyvale downtown, you're not missing anything. Uh, but there was some event happening there. And uh, usually there's nothing. So imagine the plight of the garbage disposal man coming in and realizing that this is, this is just a huge mess and he didn't expect this. If there was real-time information happening saying, hey, there was an event, uh, I'm seeing the garbage disposal overflowing, and so we probably need two garbage trucks and more men to do this, and we probably need more frequency. This is data that Sunnyvale, the city of Sunnyvale can use and, and make a better, you know, a more efficient uh, way of handling their city. So smart cities are also using these data wisely, and, and we're seeing more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, even uh, uh, governments using these kind of data uh, in a, in a uh, positive way. So, thank you. Uh, I hope I made sense in, in my entire talk, and if there's any questions, please feel free to ask.